Um, all right, at this stage, Dean, uh, do you want to run the announcement here? Uh, or sorry, run the uh, uh, um, introduction here? Oh, absolutely. Or, all right, go ahead, take it away. Thank you so much, Andrew. So I'm um, very pleased uh, uh, to introduce uh, uh, Bill Mira, um, N2CQR, club member, a uh, long time uh, 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 ham radio operator, homebrew builder, and host of the uh, Solder Smoke podcast. And Bill's going to share with us uh, kind of his philosophy on homebrew and a little bit of his, uh, his personal story. So Bill, thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, over to you. All right, Dean, thanks very much. And, and thanks to the Vienna Wireless Society for, in, for inviting me tonight. Um, my goal tonight is really just to share with you some of my experiences as a ham radio home brewer. I know many of you have a lot of experience with home brew, but I know there's also some relatively new hams in the audience. So I, all I'm going to do tonight is talk about my own personal experience with home brew radio. And I'll try to include the good, the bad, and the ugly. And Dean knows what I'm talking about here, about the bad and the ugly. But we'll talk about that in a bit. I, I want to start out by saying I don't pretend to be a master home brewer. On the Solder Smoke podcast, I work with, or, or actually you know, participate with, a guy who is a master home brewer, and that's Pete Giuliano, N6QW. I am very much kind of a, my amateur status is not challenged in this area. I'm not an electrical engineer. Everything I've learned, almost everything I've learned in this area has been self-taught. So please keep that in mind as I go through. Uh, most of my rigs are very simple. Even the single sideband transceivers that I'll describe towards the end are relatively simple. But I've had a lot of fun with this. And I want to try to share with you the reasons why it's been so fun and rewarding. I'm going to pull up my, um, my presentation here if I can find it. Uh, yes, here we go. Okay. Here we go. All right. So the title of the presentation is Rig Here is Home Brew. Oops, wait a second, hold on. I, went, I already skipped ahead. Let me go back. All right, the Rig Here is Home Brew, the joys and sorrows of bring, building your own rigs and some tips for the daring. All right, some personal background. Like many of you, I, from an early age, showed an interest in electronics and all things technical. I, at age seven, I was able to fix my grandmother's light timer on her, her house in the Bronx. She wanted the lights to come on to scare the burglars away. And I was the only one who knew how to set it up. My grandmother then de declared to the whole family that I was electrically inclined. And uh, so this sort of set the stage with what was to come. And I think you, most of you have known Dilbert. I'm gonna play a little clip here from Dilbert in his description of his situation. You may have seen this, but it's fun to watch again. I'm worried about little Dilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Oh. The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh, dear. Is that bad? Normally, I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. Than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and utter social ineptitude. Can he lead a normal life? No. He'll be an engineer. <laughs> there, there. <laughs> all right. So, little Dilbert. He had the knack, all right? And I think a lot of us know from an early age that we had the knack. My real first encounter with the knack came through this guy on the screen, Gene Shepard. He, uh, he ran a radio show in New York during the 1970s on WOR out of New York. I think it was 710 on the AM dial, 50 kilowatts, clear channel. A lot of people could hear it. Shep would get on every night and just tell stories, uh, mostly about his youth, his time in the Army, all kinds of other stories. He wrote a lot of articles for Playboy magazine. He wrote a number of really excellent books, but he was a ham radio operator. And every once in a while, his stories would focus on his experience as a, as a young ham radio operator growing up in Hammond, Illinois, Hammond, Indiana. Uh, I used to listen to Shep with my father and we, we, we had an interest, a common interest in his stories, but I really focused as a, as a young kid on his description of ham radio. And he described a ham radio that was all about home brewing. It was about technical expertise. 
he described a group of friends in his hometown who were really interested in the technical aspects of the hobby and developing building skills. And in, in the course of describing this group and, and how they went around and built their own radios and gathered parts, they would go into Chicago and visit Radio Row, bring back parts to build their radios. He, he really shared kind of an ethos for ham radio in which technical expertise was really important, building skills was really important, and there was almost kind of a hierarchy within his group of teenage friends with technical ability being what gave you street cred in this group. At one point in his stories, he talks about a friend, kind of the most advanced guy in the group, who built the very first television set that Gene Shepard ever saw. It used a tiny cathode ray tube and got picked up the signal, I think out of Chicago, of some very early experimental TV stations. But Shep was, I guess, the, the formative person in my development as a ham radio operator. And very early on, he made it clear that he expected a true radio amateur to build his own gear and to understand the gear that he was building. The understanding part was very, very important. All right, I tried as a kid to follow Shep's guidance. And one of the things that, that he said, and I picked this up from others, was that to be a true radio amateur, you should at least once in your life build your own receiver. You know, going back to the 1930s, it was common for hams to build their own transmitters, but very few hams actually built their own receivers. So I got this idea in my head, and I guess I was about 15 or 16 years old, maybe, maybe 17, and I decided I needed to take on a receiver project. So in QST Magazine, I found this, this receiver project. It was called the Herring Aid 5. You know, it's related, many of you may have, may have heard of the Tuna Tin 2. Well, this is the Herring Aid 5. And it was a five transistor receiver, a direct conversion receiver. And I, in the worst way, wanted to be able to build this thing. I wanted to, to uh, obtain the approval of Gene Shepard and people like him and build my own receiver. And I, I went and I gathered all the parts. I, uh, I etched the PC boards, I drilled all the holes, and I could not get this thing to work at all. It was a complete failure. And I had nobody to turn to. You know, I, I, I really didn't have anybody I could ask for help on this. There was no internet at the time. So um, it just sat there and didn't work, and it was a very, very disheartening experience. So I have some early experience with the, uh, the bad and the ugly part of home brewing. I'll get back to this a little bit later in the presentation. All right, I'm gonna fast forward. 1993, uh, I'm assigned to the Dominican Republic. I was in the Foreign Service when I was working and my third overseas post was in the Dominican Republic. Um, my wife, uh, my girlfriend at the time, saw all these boxes had shown up in the house and some of the boxes were unopened. And she said to me, what are in those boxes? And I said, well, that's my old ham radio stuff. And she said, well, why don't you open it up and get it going? And that was kind of the, the start of my rebirth in ham radio. I had been off the air for a while, but with her suggestion, I got back into ham radio. And I, I remember Gene Shepard's words, build something, understand what you're doing, learn something. And this is the first rig that I built. I scaled back my ambition quite a bit. And I built something super simple. It's called a Michigan Mighty Might. And it is basically a crystal oscillator that you could connect up to an antenna. The crystal is at 3579 kilocycles. And there's six, you know what five or six extra parts, and if you build this thing, you will experience. And Dean knows what I'm talking about. What we call J O O, the joy of oscillation. You will have created R F. You will have made a signal with something that you created out of your own hands. Look at my coil. It's wound on a 35 millimeter film, plastic film can. That was the coil form, and I was able to make this thing oscillate. Dean built one of these things, and I heard it all the way from Great Falls to Falls Church. But anyway, I was I was thinking, okay, this put me back on the path. Gene Shepard would approve. I continued to build when I was in the Dominican Republic. I wanted to, now that the, the Michigan Mighty Might was good, but it was a bit of a novelty. It was fixed frequency, it was very low power. I never made a contact with it. But again, the, the idea was just to produce some RF. But now I wanted to build a rig that I could actually use on the air. And this is the rig I chose. It was again out of a QST article, actually out of QRP Classics from the AWRL, And it's called the VXO Controlled Six Water. Six watts, now you've got a significantly more, significant more amount of power. And VXO controlled, so you can tune your, tune your way around. I use this with uh, a Drake 2B receiver that I still have. 
And it was one of these miracle moments. I was really careful about building this thing. I was careful about every part, every connection. I checked and double checked because I didn't want to have a repeat of my Herring Aid 5 fiasco. I wanted to get this thing right. And it was one of those great moments. I, I put it all together. I knew it was working. I turned it on. I figured out how to get on frequency. I called CQ. And the first guy who called me back was from Poland. And that was a really exciting moment. That was a very rewarding moment. And I said, wow, I have just crossed the ocean with a transmitter that I built myself. And it was a really wonderful, wonderful feeling. Um, all right. So then you can see that rig. It's in the, it's in the little box up there in the, in the uh, upper right. But still, Gene Shepard was kind of, his, his, I, I could see him saying, yeah, yeah, you built the transmitter, but what about the receiver, right? Don't, don't be, you know, don't fake it here. You built, you built half the station. So I said, okay, I'm going to build the rest of the station. And I found a, a circuit that I liked. It was called the Bare Bones Superhead or the Barbados Superhead. And it was designed by Doug DeMoy. It was a single conversion superheterodyne receiver with the inter intermediate frequency at, again, 3579, the color burst frequency. Um, and I built this thing. You can see on the right a picture of the innards of it. And I built it board by board, made sure each board was working properly, then pulled the whole thing together. And it, it worked like a charm. I, I really love this receiver. It's simplicity itself. And it was just very rewarding to build a really stable Superhead receiver. I paired it up with the... Um, with the crystal controlled VXO uh, transmitter. And I built a little power supply. You'll see it there with my call sign. So I had the power supply, the receiver, the transmitter, everything was home brewed. I even made sure I home brewed the side tone oscillator. So I was able to say to the guys, station here is home brewed. And that was a really uh, important moment. I have in the center here, a picture of some of the, the, the PC boards. And I was working at the State Department at the time. And you know, I, I had a young family, so time was tight. But what I would do is I would go to work with the schematic diagram and a few index cards in my pocket. And at lunchtime, I'd have a half hour, 45 minutes for lunch. I'd go up to the State Department library, and I would sit there and plan out the parts placement on the PC boards. So when I got home in the evening, I had already planned out how to etch those boards. And I, I would then, the next morning, etch the boards and build a circuit. So I was able to maintain that kind of rhythm and get a rig like this built in a relatively short period of time. It required some planning and discipline and time management, but I, but I was able to do it. And I, it was a great, su great success, I think. I had great fun with it. Okay, so after uh, some time in Virginia, they sent me out, the family out, to the, to the Azores Islands of Portugal. I was Charlie Uniform to Juliet Lima. And I wanted to continue home brewing because I'd really gotten into it. I had really good experiences with uh, that transmitter and receiver. And so, like, my appetite for this was whetted. You know, I, I, I liked CW, but I was always more of a phone guy. I mean, you saw Gene Shepard there in front of the microphone. So I wanted to build some phone equipment. And luckily, I came across this article from CQ Magazine by Doug DeMar called Doug's Desk. And the title of the article was Go QRP with Double Sideband. Now, I know this might be mind-blowing for some of you guys, but Double Sideband is a real possibility. It's a much simpler circuit. You'll hear guys say, oh, well, why didn't you just build a filter and just turn it into a single sideband? Having built both of them, believe me, double sideband, if you're looking for simplicity and if you're looking for a stepping stone along the kind of the continuum of home brewing, double sideband is a good place to go after you've done CW. So there you could see that in that the circuit diagram, the heart of Doug DeMoy's double sideband transmitter, and that's what I built. First, I built the transmitter, double sideband. I got it on the air, again, using the Drake 2B receiver, but then I paired it up with a little direct conversion receiver. And now I had a double sideband transceiver, and you see it in that bud box there. And I put this on the air from the Azores. Now we were at a good point in the sunspot cycle. This was 2000, 2001. Sunspots were plentiful, conditions were good. I was pretty in a pretty good DX location, halfway out in the Atlantic Ocean. It was, it was good. And I had a lot of fun with this double sideband rig. I'll show you what I mean. I would get guys who would hear me call in CQ and they would come back and say, hey, old man, you're on the wrong sideband. 17 meters is upper sideband, don't you know? And I would just sit back and smile and I would say to them very calmly, well, no, old man, you see, the thing is I'm transmitting on both sidebands. There'd be this pause. They didn't understand it. They'd never heard anything like that. Then I would really mess with them. And I'd say, you know, you could reach down there on your, your icon and hit the LSB button and you'll hear me just the same. 
And because I got a direct conversion receiver, I'll hear you just the same too. And then there'd be another pause and they would come back and they'd say, wow, you're right. How did that happen? Shazam, double sideband. Anyway, uh, I, 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 had a, I had a great time. I worked all kinds of DX with this thing. I, I liked it, I loved it. It was QRP, I never ran it really more than five watts. I always was able to listen to both sides of zero beats, so I knew I wasn't interfering with anybody. But I also knew that if I, was, if I wanted to transmit with more power, just to be courteous, I should get rid of the unnecessary sideband. So then I went to the next step and I built a single sideband transmitter. Now this was inspired by an article out of Sprat Magazine. Sprat is a wonderful quarterly magazine. We, we joke on the Solder Smoke podcast that if you, you're not subscribed to Sprat, you're just wrong. Um, and it comes out quarterly. It's filled with great ideas and articles. It's the journal of the GQRP Club, the British QRP Club. So I found in Sprat an article that described a simple single sideband transmitter, just a transmitter. I, got, I had parts, I had a junk box, I had some parts that I had taken out of a, a Swan 240 transceiver that I received in the Dominican Republic that was just totally hosed. But some of the parts were still good and I pulled the parts out of it. One of the panel meters that I used in this rig was actually from my childhood crystal radio club from 1973. So I was able to put some really old stuff in there. So wait, now here's the, here's the fun part with this. I had gotten a kind of a bit of a following on 17 meters with the double sideband rig. I was CU2JL, I was kind of a distinctive call sign. So I put this thing on the air and one of the guys calls in and says, hey Bill, something's wrong. You've lost one of your sidebands. <laughs> he was sincere, he wasn't messing with me. He thought that this was some sort of technical problem and I said, well, no, you know, actually that's the plan. That's what the single sideband's all about. We've moved on, we've moved ahead. So it, it, was, it was a very rewarding experience to move into, into that area. All right, so then back in the USA and uh, came back after we were overseas for 10 years, came back here and I started reading and I'd been in, in sort of sporadic contact with this guy in India named Ashar Farhan. He goes by Farhan. His call sign is VU2ESE. He lives in Hyderabad, Southern India. And he, is a master home brewer. He is a real homebrew genius. And he was the one who came up with the design for what became known as the BIDX, the bi-directional transceiver. It's called bi-directional because the amplifier stages are bi-directional. Uh, on receive, the signals go from right to left. On transmit, they go from left to right. And you're using the same amplifier stages and you're just switching the signal direction. And it greatly simplifies the design of, of the rig. Farhan designed the BIDX in one overnight flight from Sweden back to India. He had with him nothing but a notepad and the calculator in his cell phone. And he sat there and designed the BIDX on that flight. And then he built the first one when he got back to Hyderabad. He published the, um, the schematic. He, he built it with Indian radio amateurs in mind. So no unobtainium, no exotic, difficult, hard to get parts. Some of the coils were actually wound on like the, the, the washers from your kitchen faucet. No special, you know, ferrite toroids or iron powder toroids, nylon washer toroid coils. The, the crystal filters in this rig were homebrew from surplus computer industry crystals. And here's the thing that's most surprising about this. You could build the entire transceiver for the Indian rupee equivalent of $5 US. This is a $5 transceiver, all right? If you wanna build it, if you wanna go with the bare bones version, somebody in India, in, in, not, in, not necessarily in Delhi, but in a, in, a, in a small Indian city, you'd go to the parts market, gather the parts, and get what he or she needed to build this thing, spending less than $5. It was uh, an amazing piece of gear. I built mine, I built three of these scratch built. He, he later came out with kits and pre-assembled boards, but in the beginning, for the first 10 years, it was nothing but Farhan's schematic and gather the parts. I used a, a Manhattan style construction technique. Now I'm gonna show you guys some pictures of the innards of this and the schematic, and especially the, new, the newcomers might find this a bit shocking, so, so brace yourself, but, but I'll explain. All right, there's the schematic. And when you look at this, I look at it and I remembered how that Herring Aid 5 schematic looked to me. It looks like a jumble of parts. What the heck is that? He, somebody has put this all together. And if I just somehow reproduce this in copper and silicon, it should be an, S, an SSB transceiver. I wanna, one of the points I wanna make tonight is I think that's the wrong way to look at it. 
But let me show you another view that's even a bit scarier. All right, that's what it looks like when you've converted it into copper and silicon. Again, it looks like this jumble of parts. How could you know, if this thing didn't work, how would you know where it was not working? How, how could you possibly troubleshoot this? Well, here's a clue. When I, before I, I took that big kind of copper clad board that you see as the base and started putting parts on it, I mapped out the real estate on the board and I mapped it out by stages. So you'll see down here in the lower right, there's the mic amplifier stage. I even got a picture of my D104 joining there, look at that. There's the variable crystal oscillator next to it, various stages, various bi-directional amplifier stages. And you could follow the signal both in receive and transmit all the way through to the RF amplifiers and oop, out to the antenna. So this became sort of my guide as I built it. Now I mentioned Manhattan style construction. Let me explain what that means. You see these little pads over here, like these little squares and rectangles. If you look at, look at them from above, they're supposed to remind you of the grid pattern of Manhattan Island my hometown, by the way. It doesn't look much like Manhattan to me, but that's the idea, that what you do is you cut out, I, I use tin shears, I cut out squares and rectangles, and I super glue them right on to the, uh, to the copper clad board underneath. When I need to connect two parts that are not at ground, I, I, I solder them to one of these pads that's above ground. Anything that's going to ground is soldered directly to the, to the substrate, to that copper clad board that underlies the whole thing. This is a really excellent technique for getting stable RF circuits. It's very easy to build. It's very intuitive and you can almost follow the schematic really, really easily. So that's what I did here. That's what I mean by Manhattan style construction. All right, so there's my, my sort of real estate plan for the board. Now I'm gonna show you an animated GIF that shows you how the stages came together. I, I, the, the pace of this was probably similar to what I employed when I was building that receiver and back when I was working at the State Department is maybe, maybe one stage every few days. So here's what it looks like. There's the board. I'll let it run a little bit. Okay, so you see it's not, there's nothing, haphazard about it. You're building stages one at a time. The other thing you do is when you complete a stage, you test that stage. Don't move on to the next stage until you know that that mic amplifier is working and there's ways you can test it. You don't, then you, then you build a B frequency oscillator. Is it, is it oscillating at the proper frequency? Okay. Then you build the balance modulator. You put the mic amp and the B frequency oscillator in there and see if it produces the desired output. You move through it progressively, checking each stage as you go it makes it all much more manageable. All right, so I finished this thing, but it looked horrible. So I had to put it in a box, right? You gotta have a box. I, I went down to Michael's, the, the one that's down there by the micro, the, the computer store, there's a Michael's craft shop down there. And I went down there looking for materials. I thought I was gonna have to build my own kind of case for this thing. But I just noticed that there's this cigar box, this kind of basswood cigar box there and I had the board and I put the board in there and it was a perfect fit. This is what we call on the pod, Solder Smoke podcast, a matter a case of the radio gods have spoken. That board belonged in that box. So I went home with one of these things under my arm and I, I drilled out the holes for the controls. I popped it in there and that was the box that became the box for my, my bid X. Now, I know some of you are used to glowing numerals and you're saying, but, but, but where are the glowing numerals? There are no glowing numerals on this thing. There will be later, but you'll see I have the tuning dial and you can see off to the side of the tuning dial is a little pointer indicator. And that's, that allows you to, to figure out where you are in the frequency band. This one was built for 17 meters. This is also VXO controlled and there's two crystals in there and the crystals are controlled by this knob here. So one is for the upper portion of the 17 meter phone band, the others for the lower portion of the 17 meter phone band. Let me show you my frequency readouts. So, on the left, you have old school, all right? <laughs> on the right, you have glowing numerals, all right? But now, listen, guys, I admit it. I am a bit of a radical fundamentalist home brewer. I like analog circuitry. I like discrete components. I don't even really like integrated circuit chips, okay? I, I can be flexible, but in general, radical fundamentalist home brewer. 
So to put one of these frequency counters inside my otherwise pristine analog discrete rig was too much for me. So I made it as an outboard. It's like a little, it's like a little sidecar that sits underneath or aside the rig and I can connect it. And that gives me a very accurate frequency readout. You can see there I'm at 18144.002. I could get by very easily with my little piece of paper cut out of the, the, uh, of the notebook paper there. And, and tune for a long time, that's the way I did it. But uh, I, the glowing numerals, okay, I get it. I, I did that too. So you could do it either way. But that's how the old and new frequency readout was done. All right, so I built a few other bit X rigs and you'll see them here. You see the one with the glowing numerals over here. That's the, the 20 meter version. Uh, I built a 20 meter rig. It started out as a 2040, but I made a very poor choice in the intermediate frequency and I could not get the 40 meter portion of it stable. I made a mistake. So I just chopped out all the 40 meter circuitry and it, it remains to this day a 20 meter rig that works very, very nicely. Uh, on the right is kind of a souped up version of the bit X and it's, we call it the Digitia because it's got digital circuitry in it. You'll see an SI5351 chip and an Arduino in there. That provides the frequencies. And you'll see even I've got, a, I've got an old Yesu filter. Most of, most of the, all the other rigs have homebrew filters. Somebody sent me an old Yesu nine megahertz filter and I put that in there. And it uses a kind of amplifier circuits. They're, they're bi-directional, but they're a bit different. They're called termination insensitive amplifiers. And so this is, this is sort of a souped up version. So this is not the $5 bit X. No, no, this is probably a $50 bit X. Okay, so there, there you go. Now on the, on the left, the, the box down below is Farhan's latest version of the bit X called the micro bit X. And that's a multi-band version. I think he goes from 160 to, to 10. And uh, it's not, not really homebrew. You, when you buy it, you get the completely assembled board. But Farhan sent me one. I put it in the box, and I use it as one of my portable rigs. So those are the other bit Xs that I've worked on. All right, now, I, I, before I get to a few tips, I just want to tell you about going back to my teenage failure, going back to that Herring Aid 5. I tried again 38 years later. You know, Shepard's voice was still ringing in my head saying, you, you're, you're just, you know, you're just, you're poor. You, you didn't get that thing working. And I wanted to do it. So it took me a while to actually find the QST article, but I found it. And I rebuilt it again, carefully. And I could not get it to work. With all this experience, all this test gear, I couldn't get it to work. It was driving me nuts. I put a picture of what I had built up on the internet. And this guy down in New Zealand, an old timer, Dexter, named ZL2DEX, I'll never forget it. He shoots me an email back like hours later. And he says, you wound the oscillator coil backwards. What? See, they, they had used a Radio Shack RF choke as the main coil in the oscillator. And you were supposed to put a feedback coil around it. And so I did. But I did it backwards. So instead of having positive feedback to get the oscillator going, to get the cat chasing its tail, I was sending the feedback out of phase. Look, you can see the two signals on the oscilloscope there, completely out of phase. That is not going to result in oscillation. So I, did, I, I followed Dexter's advice. I took it apart. I rewound it. It's only, it was only four or five turns, but I wound it in the opposite direction. Boom, the thing oscillates, and I finally got the thing working. So there were a lot of lessons here understanding, really thinking and understanding was what let Dexter solve the problem and what was really caused part of my problem. But also another thing, there were shortcomings in the QST article. They, they didn't make it clear about how you had to wind it. There were also errors in the QST article. And this is something I'll point out now just in passing. Don't think that that article that you got out of QST or 73 or, or QRP quarterly is without errors. They have a lot of errors in them. And this is where your understanding of what's going on helps you spot something that's not quite right. But in 2014, I had more knowledge, books, test gear, and Dexter over the internet. And that's what led me to, to actually get this thing fixed. And I got, it, I got it to work. There it is, the final working version. I've used it on the air. I've had, I've had contacts with it. Great fun. It only took me 38 years. All right, now I'll just close with some, some tips on, on home brewing. And I know many of you know this, know these tips far better than I do, but I'll just pass them on. Um, first, start small. Don't jump straight into a big SSB transceiver project. What you see there is the Michigan Mighty Might of Dean, KK4DAS, all right? 
that was what he started building, what, like last winter, right? In the winter time. And he, it took him a while. Pete Giuliano and I were talking to him about it on the internet. And I actually sent him that crystal. And his wife, the post, the post office rejected the envelope. And his wife had to go to the, to the post office to pay money to get this thing shipped from Falls Church, Virginia to Great Falls, Virginia. All right. All right. But there's a, there's a lot of soul in this machine, we say. Anyway, uh, he got it working and put it, connected it to an antenna and called CQ. And I could hear him here in Falls Church, Virginia. I think he went out, also went out onto Reverse Beacon Network and other stations were hearing him too. There's a benefit in starting out small. This looks really goofy, but you've gained experience. You've built something. Your confidence level is higher. You, you've produced RF. You've worked with one stage and it, it, it sort of prepares you for bigger and better things. Um, don't view rigs as a massive collection of parts and wires. When you see that big schematic, like the one I showed you for the BIDX, view it as a collection of sub-circuits and focus on those sub-circuits. Now, the picture I have here is of Dean's single sideband rig. And he's had great success with this thing. It was designed by, my, by our friend Pete Giuliano. But I think the important thing from this picture to see is that how each of the stages, he actually has them on their own separate boards. And this encourages this sub-circuit way of looking at the rig. It also makes it easier to troubleshoot. You know, when, you, when, you, when the thing is not working, which board is not working? And you've got it you there. Also, you, you can write on the board. Look, first QSO, Gary, VE3XN. This is the great thing about home brewing. You could have it your own way. Uh, focus on the circuits. Don't look at it as just one massive collection of parts. Follow Gene Shepard's advice. You should always strive to understand the circuit you're building. Now, this requires some study, some, some work, but, uh, and some head scratching a lot of times, but it's, it's worth it because the, the understanding will pull you through when things go bad. Also, you'll get a whole lot more satisfaction out of it knowing that you know how the thing really works. The, the, your rig is not a mystery box. It's something that you built, you understand, and you can fix. Um, here's, this is important, be patient. This is not plug and play radio. This is not easy. So for every moment of joy, for every joy of oscillation moment, as Dean will tell you, there is a tale of woe. You will get into a problem that you can't fix. Don't pull your hair out. Take, take it easy. Take a break. Oh, somebody's mic. Okay. Take a break. Take a walk around the block. I'm going to show you a quick story from Gene Shepard. And I have some of his stories. I'll show you the link. But Shepard talks about the time that he was having trouble with his Heising modulator. He had a modulator on 160 meter AM and he knew it was distorting and guys on the air were telling him that his signal sounded terrible and that he better go and get it fixed. Around the same time, he had arranged a first date with a girl from his high school. I guess he was about 15, 16 years old. So in the midst of these Heising modulator problems, the time for the date comes up and he takes the girl out and she notices that he's extremely distracted. He's not listening to what she's talking about. He's not paying a lot of attention to her. And obviously something's wrong. So the girl says to him, what's wrong? Is something bothering you? And he looks and he says, well, yes, it's my Heising modulator. It's distorting and I can't make it stop. And she looks at him and she said, I think there's something wrong with you. I think your mother should take you to the doctor. So Dilbert, I mean, this was Shep's story. Don't let this happen to you. Take it easy. Take a break. All of us, you'll get into a point where you just can't make this thing work. At that point, stop working on it. Put it up on the shelf. Come back in a week, you know, and then maybe you'll take another look at it. But it's, it is not easy. As you build your rigs, build up your library, your workbench, your parts supply, your junk box. All these things make it easier for you to be a home brewer. As far as books go, I think this is really important. Don't think that any single book is going to provide you with all the answers and all the knowledge that you need. The AWRL handbook, it's good as far as it goes, but I, I, there are many times where I read the descript, their descriptions of a circuit, and I don't know what the heck they're talking about. It doesn't speak to me. You could find other books that on a particular circuit or a particular rig seem to provide the kind of information and answers that you need. So I think it, it does take a library here, right? and I, I recommend that you build one or, or gain access to one. Um, join forces with like-minded builders from near and far. There's Dex, ZL2DEX, the guy who fixed my Herring Aid 5 from all the way in New Zealand. Uh, he's, he's still, you know, he's still very active in a lot of the groups. And there's Pete Giuliano, N6QW. 
the master home brewer. We made Pete, I think Dean was involved in this. We asked, we asked Pete, how many SSB transceivers have you built in your life? And the latest number we have is 36, all right? So a lot of experience, all kinds of different circuitry, all tubes, transistors, phasing, crystal, you name it, Pete has built it. And he's very good at sharing his knowledge with, with others. And he is the co-host of the Solder Smoke podcast. All right, Solder Smoke. This is a quote. This was really the origin of the podcast's title. I listened to the magic that only comes from a radio that you built yourself. Look at the look of satisfaction on that man's face. All right. That, that, is, that is the joy of oscillation right there. And I, I put at the, in, in, in the book, in that one sentence, Ian Abbott, who was a guy on the boat anchors mailing list, described the feeling that can arise in the midst of a room full of solder smoke and the reward that awaits those who build their own gear. So I think you should follow Shep's advice. Try to build your own gear. Try to understand it. It's a lot of fun. It doesn't have to be really complicated. And you don't have to, I'm, I'm, I'm proof that you don't have to be uh, a university trained electrical engineer to, to take this kind of thing on. I, I've got some links here to the Solder Smoke blog, uh, our podcast, some YouTube videos. And there's Gene Shepard. You can look at some of Gene's, listen to some of Gene's stories. These are all the ones about ham radio. And many of my sim single rigs are described there. So really, that's, that's it. Um, and I'd be happy to, to take any questions. Anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to, to try to answer them. If I could turn, how do I get my, st oh, stop screen sharing, stop share. There we uh, go. You, can, you can actually keep that up if, if you like. I think some people would be more than happy to copy down a few. They're going to they're gonna send it around. They're going to put the whole thing out. <laughs> and gonna send Excellent. It around. Excellent. Well, first, uh, um, I'll say we're going to get to questions, but that was excellent, Bill. Uh, really, really interesting. I enjoyed it. I think I'm going to have to listen to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you like it. Oh, yeah. So we got a, a few questions here for you. Um, so I just want to make sure I get the, to the first one that came up. Kevin, looks like he was the first one. So there's a, the, one of the first boxes you showed in the presentation. It looks like it's uh, a lot of plastic and metal. Um, he's just kind of Yeah, you were, he, he was using a plastic box, but he yeah. had metal on the outside. Because I'm trying to build a, take one of my radios and build it. Only I'm making a 3D box. Three, I'm 3D printing the box, and yeah. I want to be able to put metal to keep the RF shielded. Well, what you can do is you'll you'll notice in some of the pictures that I had of the bid axes that, that I, I used the, the wooden box out of Michaels, which provides no shielding at all. I'll tell you, it worked just fine. But then later on, I wanted to be a little bit more careful, and I wanted some shielding. So when I built the Digitia, I went to Home Depot and I got some of that copper tape. They they sell it like for for the use on back porches. You can get it pretty wide. And I just coated the entire inside of the box with copper tape, in effect, creating a, a metal copper shield around the whole inside of the wooden box. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. But I'll tell you, sometimes it'll work with no shielding at all. And, and, and that BIDX-17, I never had any problem due to the lack of shielding in the, in the box. Just for your information, uh, I apologize. I'll get off real quick. Uh, I used to work for EF Johnson. And um, I learned, I, I, I have designed circuits. My very first RF circuit, was a 900 megahertz one watt amplifier with an MRF 581, and it was built. Yeah, that's right. With um, with Manhattan. Yeah. And it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. Um, all right. Let's see here. I got one from John. He says, uh, "When were you in Azores?" Oh yeah, we were, we were in the Azores from 2000 to 2003. Okay. Wow. All right, so John was there in 56 through 57. So. He, was probably, he was probably over on Tercera Island at the Air Force Base at Lodges, I'm guessing. Okay. I was, and I was not allowed to get on the air over there. Uh, there was quite a bit of hassling with a uh, Portuguese communications uh, officer, and uh, uh, we lost. No, too bad. <laughs> I, too, it was a great place to be on the air. If you look at a globe when you're sitting in the Azores, if you look south, there is nothing between you and Antarctica except water and a couple of really cool islands, Tristan da Cunha, Ascension, Go, all these places down there. So a really good DX location. Cool, cool. Um, all right, we got one from uh, Andrew Doan, uh, N9KT. Uh, you were showing off that uh, old circuit from your uh, teenage years that you claimed utter failure on. And uh, Andrew was wondering, 
did you get uh, the original one to work or did you actually start from scratch and rebuild? No, I, st I started from scratch. I don't know where the original one went. It, it, mm -hmm. It's just one of these things that fades away out of your parents' house somewhere. Okay. Uh, but no, <laughs> I, I completely rebuilt it. So I, I built it improperly twice. <laughs> that was his uh, second part of the question was, was it the same mistake again? So, it was the yeah. same mistake. It was. <laughs> and I, you know, it's funny. I, di I didn't know enough about it. I should have been able to realize that the oscillator wasn't oscillating. The rest of the receiver was working perfectly. Yeah. If I had, I, I was so close and it would have been, it would have been so cool to get that thing working as a teenager, but nope. All righty. Um, so I don't know how much you know about this one, or I certainly don't have an answer to this, but, uh, uh, Mike K for FBI is asking if there's any homebrew nets on HF. Uh, you, you know, about you know uh, the, 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 to tell you the truth, there there is so little homebrew activity. Yeah. I have count, especially on phone. Now there's more on CW, but I'm not much of a CW guy anymore. You will run into homebrew rigs on CW more frequently than you do on phone. But on phone, the number of guys who are running homebrew single sideband rigs on the air, you. I mean, probably I've had maybe six contacts like that, right? And there are, I don't think there are any nets. There are some nets devoted to kind of older equipment. And there is a net on 40 meters devoted to guys who are using the kind of the kit version of the BIDX transceiver. And that's kind of fun too. So there, I guess that would be the answer. I would say the, the BIDX, the bi-directional transceiver net, I think they get together once or twice a week on 40 meters. And I, I have noticed some guys there. Farhan's intent in, in putting that rig out was to stimulate kind of tinkering, modification, working on rigs. You know, it's scary if you're working on a rig that costs you four or five thousand dollars. It's not quite so scary when the rig costs you fifty bucks or a hundred bucks. You know, even if you blow it up, <laughs> get another one. Yep. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's the, I know that feeling. <laughs> or fi or fix the or fix the one you you have. You know, many yep. guys many guys have given up and they send them to me. I'm like I'm like the orphanage of BIDX forties, <laughs> right? And I get them. It's great. I fix them. I send them on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh. Jeez. Oh, uh, one one yeah. other thing I wanted to mention. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I didn't. You know, when I showed you my superhead, my Doug Dumas superhead picture, <laughs> the the bare bones superhead Barbados. If you look closely at that picture. The, um, the frequency readout is the top of a coffee can, all right? Mm. So I needed something that would spin around as I turned the dial, and I realized that a coffee can top, you know, after you run the, the metal coffee can top, was about the right size. Mm. So I put it on there, and that became my, my frequency readout for the, for the bare bones superhead. Oh, cool. And that kind of stuff, it just, it's just very satisfying. You know, you, you look at it, and you think, there's probably no one else in the world right now who has a coffee can top for their frequency readout on 17. <laughs> I am the only one. <laughs> and that's it, pretty cool. Uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to uh, mention something you had kind of said a little bit earlier about nets on uh, homebrew too. Um, it seems to me that, you know, CW, right? There's to do a homebrew uh, rig for CW, there's a, a, a slightly simpler process for building that versus doing a, a phone rig, I, I think. And so that might explain a little bit why there's a few more um, contacts out there. Yeah, I think that's it too. And also this gets into the whole area of QRP. I'm a, I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm, a, I'm a QRP operator. I've been involved in QRP. There are guys who like QRP because they like the low power. Yeah. There are guys who like it because it's, it's CW focused. And I mm -hmm. understand that. For me, I always liked it because it was sort of a way to gain technical knowledge and find guys who are working on circuitry. So I was more into it for the circuitry. Um, you know, Pete Giuliano and I are both members of the QRP Hall of Fame, I'll let you know. <laughs> neither of us are, are really kind of hardcore, dedicated, you know, religious fervor, five watts, never above <laughs> kind of guys, no. And, and neither of us really make use of CW much more. So we're, we're, we're always joking that we're kind of teetering on the edge of expulsion from the QRP <laughs> Hall of Fame. Nice. <laughs> I might be expelled. <laughs> hey, Andrew, I, I, won't, I won't. I won't vote. I I won't vote for that, even though I am a CW. <laughs> um, all right. I, I heard Lee speak up, but before I get to that, um, I have one. I think this is uh, one definitely needs to be heard. Uh, uh, definitely here. Um, it's uh, Duncan, uh, I think, and it says uh, I'm a 14 year old 
hopefully soon to be licensed ham, getting into the hobby, would you think it better to build my first transmitter or buy a radio and start homebrewing afterwards? I don't know. You know, it's a tough, it's a tough question. I, and I, I kind of, in your position as a 14-year-old, I kind of did both. Because when I was struggling with that Herring Aid 5, I also had a Drake 2B and a Helicrafters HT37 commercial gear. And that got me on the air. It kept me going. So I, I don't think we should be kind of doctrinaire or hardcore about it. I, I would say do, try to do both. My advice would be to do both. Get, the, get some of the commercial gear, use that to get on the air, have fun with it. But then remember Gene Shepard's you know, advice because he, it's good advice and it'll open up a, a whole world of, uh, of new activity for you that I think in Ham Radio you'd find very rewarding. So yeah, I would say do both. Get the commercial gear, but then don't forget to, to melt some solder also. <laughs> That sounds like good advice, Duncan. Did you uh, have anything additional you wanted to ask? Follow up, maybe. Feel free to go ahead and ask. Yep. Um, there you go. So, I see you, Duncan. Hi. Yeah. So, um, I'm new to the hobby, of course. Um, before what I was really just doing, my dad and I've really just been building little half adder circuits on breadboards and um, doing other fun things like that. Um, and so, um, for the past two years, my family and I, we've been. Um, he works, my dad works for the State Department, and so he's on, um, he was on tour in New Zealand, and so kind of what I got, the way I got interested in this was um, first Friday of every month, we have to call into the embassy, and so that's kind of just how I yeah. got into it, yeah. and so. My, my kids did the same thing, Duncan. We had to call in every Friday, and they, they, they were taught how to use the radio in an emergency, too, so I know exactly what you're talking about. So I guess my question is, kind of like I'm trying to work this um like what, what do you think's the best way to like you know like is is there one certain thing that i should start doing now to try to um become more educated about the hobby or yeah i i think you should try to find some books that uh that, that'll explain things to you that are at the right level you don't want to get into I, mean, I remember when I was starting out, I would, I would get some books that were written at sort of at the PhD electrical engineer level, and I was totally lost. But if you get books that are more oriented towards the beginning radio amateur, they can explain things much more clearly to you and get you off to a good start. I would also say, you know, don't miss out on the fun of building, and there's real simple stuff that you could build. The Michigan Mighty Might, I think you're an excellent candidate for the Michigan Mighty Might, and I will send you a crystal, the key part that you can't get, all the other parts, and I'm sure Dean will help you too, because he's recently built one. You build one of these little things, and then suddenly you realize, wow, I've created a little radio transmitter. That's the first step. And then more fun after that, if you build a direct conversion receiver, sort of similar to my Herring Aid 5, but make sure yours works, because mine didn't. <laughs> but if you get one that works, then that really, really opens up the world for you, because you can listen to other people talking. You can listen to CW, you can listen to sideband. And then you become sort of a shortwave listener. We, I, I've recently gotten back into shortwave listening, listening to broadcast stations from other parts of the world. You set up a little wire in your backyard and you can hear signals coming in from the other side of the planet. It's really a lot of fun. So we'll, we'll help you, Duncan. And just you, you let me know through the club or you send us a text or something. And if you need any parts, we'll get them to you and, and get, you, get you on the right path, okay? Thank you. Okay. I, I uh, just want to say, well, first of all, welcome, Duncan, to the club. Uh, glad to see you here. Um, it's great to, to see such young energy here. So I think uh, we, I think we're all going to look forward to seeing you build some stuff. And if you need any help, reach out to any of us. All righty. So I don't think I have any other. Lee, did you have a question? I have a, uh, a comment or two real quick. And, and um, for Duncan, I think. You know, the one thing I think which is probably the best thing to go out and buy, and you can buy them for 50 bucks, 75 bucks today, is a, is a semi-decent HF receiver. Because that gives a kind of the basic tool. And back in the 40s and 30s, you know, <laughs> decades ago, a lot of hams would build their own transmitter, but they would have a commercial receiver. Because that was the, you know, that was, because you knew where you were, and, you know, it, it, you could adjust the people in. And then a lot of people roll their own transmitters. And, you know, today you can easily do that for, you know, still a couple dollars. <laughs> um, one interesting little receiver I saw designed for lately, literally used one transistor and one audio amp as a super regen. It was using an LM380. 
and which is a two dollar IC and, and one transistor, a couple of resistors, capacitors, and a variable capacitor, and you had a uh, receiver. So you can literally build a receiver to play with, but I would would think that getting a good one that you can trust, like like the two B that Bill's talking about, or something that you can pair up with a ham fest, an old receiver, um, is a good good way to start. The other comment I want to make about um, homebrewing in general is one thing we have to watch out for today is some of the parts. I just um, recently built a, um, I haven't quite got it finished yet, but it's a uh, 40 meter transceiver that was in, featured in QST back in 20, 2012, 2014. Um, and I built the oscillator and the oscillator didn't work. I'm looking at it going, well, what's wrong with it? And the problem was the capacitors, I had some junk parts and I had some old cheap ceramic capacitors that not out of my junk box, but literally kind of new. And I replaced the capacitors with some silver mica ones on my junk box and it worked fine. So the problem was the capacitors themselves were so lossy and had such terrible Q circuit that is they were very resistive. Uh, and leaky that the oscillator wouldn't work. <laughs> so I had to go back and pull some better quality capacitors out of my junk box and then it worked fine. Yeah, I think Lee, I think you're, you're, you're just, that's just a confirmation of what we've been talking about. You had the knowledge to, to kind of understand where the problem might be that help you. you. You were working on one particular stage. Right. So you, you were focused on the oscillator and you, you suspected the capacitors and sure enough, that was it. So it, it made it easier for you to fix it. You're right, sometimes, sometimes you get parts that, that look great and they're not, you test them. Sometimes they're marked incorrectly. That's why, as, Lee, as Dean will tell you, and as you know, it's, it's often a tale of woe, <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. And you know, my latest problem has been, I have a commercial radio that I'm trying to restore and I can't get the thumb thing neutralized. <laughs> what radio, Lee? What radio? It's the uh, Halicrafters transceiver. It uses a pair of sweep tubes. Uh, okay. And I, you know, you're trying to tune it up and try to get neutralized on tune it on the 15 or 10. It works great on 40 meters, but when I'm up on 10 or 15, uh, all of a sudden it took off oscillating and the plate current just Ooh. goes through the roof and it actually blows a um, resistors in the high voltage one. <laughs> I think you, you just legitimized Bill's entire presentation uh, through that comment there. Hey, Bill, uh, this is uh, this is Kevin again. Sorry, to, another comment real quick. Sure. You, men you mentioned don't get the double E books because they'll really confuse you. Yeah. As I say, I got an MS double E and I have a collection of simple books. You well, get, good. When you, get down, when you get down to the, it's, when you get down to the basic ideas of when you get down to building something, the big, the fancy books are great for like work or analysis and that kind of stuff, but you gotta build it. Yeah. I mean, you talked about yeah. ubiquitous. I've, I've been hearing all sorts of conversations ubiquitous about how their amplifiers have really high gain at like 80 meters, but nothing at 10. Well, I actually designed IRF 510s that are broad banded from three to 30 megs using a feedback loop, and I intend to try that on ubiquitous on, on my ubiquitous uh, hopefully soon. So. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right. Yeah, but I agree. Yeah. You know, that it, because it also, it looks the, the kind of, the kind of understanding that you want. A lot of times the simple books will be providing you with a kind of real kind of in the gut understanding of how this thing works, right? Similar to the kind of understanding, you know, how a car engine works, you know, how the pistons move and how it turns the, the drivetrain. And you're, you're, you're seeking that kind of understanding of electronic circuitry. A lot of times in the higher level books, they're, they're so beyond that. And they're so into the mathematics that they become disconnected from the physical reality of the rig. I'm much more attuned or interested in the physical, kind of the intuitive gut level understanding of it. Yeah. I would recommend, if you want a book, I would recommend one book, and that is the Experimental Methods in RF that was put out. I think that has the best explanation of basic yeah. amplifiers, how to bias a transistor amplifier, you know, yeah, the very basics. You know, it's a wonderful book and, and, and Farhan and a few others kind of led an effort to make sure that the ARRL kept that in print for a few more years. But, and I agree with you, it's a wonderful book. But for me, the predecessor book, Solid State Design for the Radio Amateur, for me, that's better. I, Pete Giuliano likes that one better also. It's older, and I, and I talked to Wes Hayward, who wrote both books, 
And he says, well, why are you using the old one? You should use the new one. And I say to him, well, well, Wes, the old one seems to speak to me better. All right. It, it, it seems to answer my questions better. And I, I like it better. So uh, it's, it's out of print and it's that's, you know, the, almost on a tanium on the whole. It's so. it, it really is about um, finding the book that speaks to you. That's it. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's that matters more than, you know, anything else. Yep. Um, all right. I don't think we have any more uh, questions at the moment. So I'm going to, first of all, say thank you, Bill. Okay. Um, excellent presentation, but I want to hand over to Dean for a moment. He has a few comments he'd like to say uh, to you, I think, in closing. Bill, no, first of all, awesome, Bill. Fantastic presentation. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for the shout out. Thank you for showing my mighty <laughs> might and my, uh, and my furlough 40. The club here has been following the uh, travails of my furlough 40 through our reflector for the last uh, several months. And I keep telling about tell them about the great Elmers that I've got between you and and uh, Pete. Um, and you're absolutely right. There are tales of woe along the way where you just want to throw the thing away. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, it can drive you completely crazy. But that first night when I got the receiver working, kind of like like uh, Farhan says, when you get the receiver working, stop, listen to it listen to the thing that you've made receiving RF over the years. It's just, it's just magic. And uh, had a, had a ter terrific time, uh, time doing that. And uh, I gave a presentation to the club a couple of weeks ago on, on Manhattan style. So they kind of saw what the idea was. And then your presentation kind of brings it home that that's what you get if you follow that, that process. So anyway, thank you so much, Bill. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for the invite. But I just want to say one thing. Let's, let's help out Duncan. I, I yeah. think we have a special I, obligation. I, I especially feel a special obligation because he's a foreign service kid, just like my kids are. And so we're going we're gonna to help you out, Duncan. And I might have a receiver here that you could use. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to get it in your hands, okay? okay. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate Thank it. You so much, Bill. Um, really appreciate it. Excellent presentation. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Stay safe. You too. Take care.